Hello, and welcome to the National Park Service and the Federal Aviation Administration's public meeting for the draft air tour management plan and environmental assessment for Bandelier National Monument. My name is Michelle Carter. I'm an environmental protection specialist with the National Park Service, and I'll be serving as your moderator this evening. I'm gonna start off here by defining a couple of acronyms that you'll hear us use throughout the meeting. You'll hear us refer to the National Park Service as the NPS, the Federal Aviation Administration as the FAA, the Air Tour Management Plans as ATMPs, and the Environmental Assessment as the EA. We'll define the remaining acronyms as we go along. Next slide, please. We're holding this virtual public meeting to review the draft ATMP for Bandelier and to take questions. Um, so, as I just mentioned, we're holding this virtual public meeting to review the draft ATMP for Bandelier and to take questions on the draft and the EA. The meeting is being held pursuant to the National Parks Air Tour Management Act of 2000, also known as NEPATMA, and its implementing regulations. You're going to hear a little bit more about NEPATMA and the draft ATMP shortly, along with information on how you could submit questions and your official comments. But before we dive into the presentations, I'm going to take a minute to introduce our presenters and provide information about the meeting logistics and how you can participate. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, so as I introduce folks, I'll ask you just to come on camera really quick. Uh, we're starting off with Eric Elmore. He's the Senior Policy Advisor with the Office of Environment and Energy with FAA. We have Ashley Pipkin, an outdoor recreation planner with the National Parks Na National Park Service Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division. From the park, we have Patrick Suddeth, the park superintendent, and we also have Jamie Sevatello, the park's integrated resources manager. Eric and Ashley are going to provide a brief, brief overview of NAPATMA and the purpose of today's meeting. And then we'll hear from Superintendent Seda and Jamie, who will give us a little bit more information from the park's perspective and to discuss park-specific resources along with the draft ATMP. Next slide. Actually, I think we're on the right slide. So thank you for that. My apologies here. Um, so as far as the questions go throughout the evening, we invite you to submit your questions and they'll be addressed after the presentations as part of the Q&A session. Uh, we're taking questions via a Google form and it looks like we've already had a couple come in. Uh, so you can access the Google form by scanning the QR code that you see on the screen um, or by clicking on a link that one of the meeting hosts will be able to drop into the chat area of the platform that you're, you're viewing the meeting on. Questions that are submitted uh, through the meeting tonight are going to be considered by the agencies as they conti continue developing the draft ATMP, but they're not considered formal comments. Next slide, please. All of the official comments we're asking that you submit through the National Park Service Planning, Environment, and Public Comment Site, or PEPSI as we call it, uh, that's the acronym, um, or we ask that, that uh, any comments are submitted to uh, the mailing address that's going to be listed on the park's PEPSI site. Only comments received through one of these two avenues will become part of the official record, and they must be submitted on or before August 11th at Midnight Mountain Time. Agencies are not accepting official comment via email, just those other two means. Um, and we'll short share a little bit more about this later in the presentation. Next slide, please. So while the meeting is being broadcasted via YouTube Live, as I just mentioned, we'll be accepting questions with the Google form. Um, if folks happen to have joined uh, late, I'm gonna just ask periodically through the meeting that the uh, the meeting hosts are able to drop that in in case people miss it. Um, so if you submit your questions using that link, it's going to help us manage the Q&A when the time comes. And if we're getting similar questions, we'll be able to group them together. When we enter the Q&A session of the meeting, uh, our goal is to do our best to get to all of the questions. We're going to have the presenters read the questions aloud and do their best to provide a response. And depending on how many questions we get, 
um, there may be a delay. So as we kind of see how things go with the Q&A session, if there is a delay, uh, we may actually also review some frequently asked questions that are currently posted on the website. Um, and we may also pull up some questions that were asked uh, during recent public meetings if they have any applicability toward what we're talking about here for Bandelier. So the overall time that we have set aside for the meeting is 90 minutes. Um, and I just mentioned and apologize for the redundancy here, but uh, we will do our best to keep the meeting open afterwards if there is a little bit of a delay with you guys having uh, any issues with submitting questions. So we appreciate you joining us this evening to learn more about the draft ATMP. We're gonna now play a short video overview before I turn it over to Eric and Ashley to provide additional details about NAPATMA and why we're here today. The United States is home to some of the most breathtaking national parks and tribal lands in the world. It is important that we protect these lands while ensuring that the public has ample opportunity to enjoy these national treasures. Air tours offer the public a totally different type of experience. The Federal Aviation Administration and the National Park Service work together to manage air tours over national parks. We are developing plans that help protect wildlife, wilderness character, cultural resources, natural soundscapes, and visitor enjoyment. These plans are known as air tour management plans. And today, we will explore the specifics of the draft plan for your park. As part of our planning process, we consult with tribes, Native Hawaiian organizations, state and tribal historic preservation officers, and wildlife biologists. We assess noise, wildlife protection, and other environmental considerations and we'll continue to make adjustments to these plans as needed. And we consider the appropriate level of National Environmental Policy Act review for these plans. The FAA and the National Park Service are committed to ensuring safe flights at our national parks while safeguarding park resources. Following today's presentation, we encourage you to review your park's draft air tour management plan and provide official comments through the National Park Service Planning, Environment, and Public Comment website. Together, we can celebrate these special places and ensure they can be enjoyed for generations to come. So again, welcome. Thank you, Michelle. Welcome, everybody. My name is Eric Elmore. I am a senior a policy advisor in the Office of Environment and Energy, and I work for the Federal Aviation Administration out of uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, headquarters. And tonight I'm going to provide you with a brief overview of NAPATMA, and then I'll hand it off to my park colleagues. Um, so starting off at a high level, NAPATMA, the National Parks Air Tour Management Act, otherwise known as NAPATMA, requires a number of things, but in particular, I'd like to call out uh, a couple of things. So first, NAPATMA requires the FAA, uh, in cooperation with the National Park Service, to develop either an air tour management plan or a voluntary agreement for those parks where operators have applied to conduct commercial air tours. Um, I would like to note that commercial air tours have been occurring um, prior to NAPATMA. NAPATMA was passed in 2000. And um, at that time, operators were required, who were conducting tours were required to request authorization from the FAA. And I'll talk about that a little bit um, in a second. Next, another requirement of NAPATMA is really the applicability. Uh, where does it apply? So uh, it applies to uh, the park boundary plus a half mile outside of that boundary. So thinking horizontally, that's kind of one aspect of it. And then vertically, we're talking about from ground level to 5,000 feet above ground level. So that's kind of the jurisdictional boundaries that the Park Service and FAA are working with when we're talking about um, dealing with commercial air tours. Uh, of note is what NAPATMA does not apply to, and it's very important to, to make note that NAPATMA does not apply to general aviation. Um, it does not apply to commercial airline operations. 
It does not apply to military flights, nor does it apply to other similar type of flights, like uh, maybe administrative flights conducted by the uh, National Park Service. And then finally, as I alluded to earlier, uh, NAPATMO required us back in 2000 to grant Interim Operating Authority or IOA to uh, operators who were conducting air tours at that time. Um, it uh, anticipated the Park Service and FAA completing an air tour management plan within kind of two year period. And then at that time, IOA would go away. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, but next slide, please. So what are what are the objectives of, of an air tour management plan or an ATMP? Um, according to NAPATMA, the objective is to develop acceptable and effective measures to mitigate or prevent the significant adverse impacts, if any, of a commercial air tour operations on the park's natural and cultural landscapes and resources, areas of historic and spiritual significance to Native Americans, the wilderness character, as well as the visitor experience. Next slide, please. Now, what can an air tour management do? What can be some of the conditions and limitations that are contained in an air tour management plan? So again, under NAPATMA, it spells out that an air tour management plan may prohibit commercial air tour operations, either in whole or in part. It can establish conditions for the conduct for how air tours are conducted, including establishing routes, altitudes, maybe time of day restrictions, restrictions for particular events, events, excuse me, um, as well as maybe limiting the maximum number of flights, uh, as well as maybe some other aspects. It does apply, it shall apply to all commercial air tour operations, again, within that airspace, a half mile outside the park boundary and up to 5,000 feet AGL. It shall include an air tour management plan, shall include incentives for adoption of quiet aircraft technology. We'll talk a little bit about that given the alternative. Um, also an air tour management plan shall provide for the allo, initial, initial allocation of opportunities to conduct air tours when the ATMPs limit the number of operations. And finally, um, the ATMP shall justify and document the need for the measures taken pursuant to the above and include those justifications in what we call a record of decision. Um, at this time, I think I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Ashley, who's gonna give you a little bit more information in regards to um, air tour management plans. So thank you, Ashley. Thanks for that overview, Eric. Hi, I'm Ashley Pipkin, and I'm a planner with the Overflights program in the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division, and I live in Nevada. On this slide, you will see a map of the US with all of the National Park Service sites that we are in the process of completing air tour management plans for. As stated before, the National Parks Air Tour Management Act requires that we do air tour planning for these parks. Most of the parks that require air tour planning are in the Western United States. Many of them are in Utah and California, and Bandelier is the only park in New Mexico that currently requires the air tour management planning. Next slide. Here's a list of those parks we saw on the previous map and their current status. As you can see, we have completed ATMPs for 13 parks. I don't need to list them all off. But if you are interested in learning more about those plans, you can visit NPS or FAA's air tour management plan websites. We have completed one volunteer agreement with the National Parks of New York Harbor, which addresses air tours around the Statue of Liberty and Governor's Island. There are four parks that we have recently held public meetings for in May and, Ju in May and in June of this year, and we accepted public comments for them, but have not yet completed them. Those are Haleakala, Hawaii Volcanoes, Badlands, and Mount Rushmore. We are obviously meeting here today for Bandelier and are in the planning process for four more National Park Service units. There will be updates later on about what is available for public review. Next slide. Here we have um, the development process for the ATMPs. 
When an ATMP is ready to go, the NPS and the FAA publish a notice of availability of that draft ATMP in the Federal Register. Then we make that document available on Pepsi, and that's when we can start accepting comments. We hold at least one public meeting as required by NEPATMA, and we also have to comply with other federal legal requirements like the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA and Section 106 and Section 7, which will be discussed later in this presentation. It's also worth mentioning here that we have actually gone through an ATMP planning process before for Bandelier National Monument, and we held a public meeting and put out an air tour management plan for Bandelier in September of 2021. Through comments, feedback, and tribal consultation we received during that planning effort, the agencies determined that an, envir that an environmental assessment should be drafted, and we will be reviewing this new draft ATMP for Bandelier today. The purpose of today's meeting is to review the components of the Bandelier National Monument draft ATMP from the 2023 planning effort and get feedback on that document and answer any questions you may have. Next slide. With that, I want to turn it over to the Bandelier to Bandelier's superintendent, Patrick Seda, to provide some details about the park and this air tour management plan. Great, thank you, Ashley, appreciate that. And good evening, everybody. My name is Patrick Sedith. I am the superintendent of Bandelier National Monument. First of all, I want to acknowledge that Bandelier National Monument is the traditional land of many tribal nations. Their cultures, lifestyles, religious beliefs, and traditions have shaped this land and continue to be shaped by their ties to this place. We honor and prioritize the voices and values of these tribal nations to enhance the quality of our shared land stewardship. As Ashley said, I'd also like to acknowledge that this is our second public meeting concerning the park's draft air tour management plan. In our last meeting, almost two years ago, and ironically on my fourth official day in my current position, the park and the FPA, FAA presented a proposed management plan that was drafted based on what would have been considered standard parameters of, parameters of similar plans with parks with air tours. Like many parks, the plan accounted for existing use. It examined impacts typically associated with air tours like noise levels and impacts to wildlife, among other things. During that meeting and in subsequent conversations, many of you that are likely on this meeting as well, let us know that we had failed to account for the cultural importance and utilization of the park by those with traditional and ancestral connections. We heard from many tribes with a near united voice that many of you felt that cultural and religious connections to sites in the park had not been adequately considered. I commented early on as I got into this position that I would listen to and honor the voices of those of you that have connected with this place for time immemorial. And because of this, we have revised our preferred alternatives, which we will share with you now. So next slide, please. Bandelier National Monument protects and preserves over 33,000 acres of the Pajarito Plateau in the Jemez Mountains of New Mexico, including some of the largest concentrations of ancestral Pueblo architectural site, archaeological sites, excuse me, in the American Southwest. Over 23,000 acres of this rugged volcanic landscape are designated as wilderness. The park provides abundant opportunities to connect with and enjoy a diversity of natural and cultural resources, striking scenery, and rich ecosystems. Tribes have accessed and used this land for millennia. The land provides a context for continuing traditional practices by, by surrounding indigenous communities. Next slide, please. This slide shows the draft ATMP boundary. Again, this includes the entire park, including a half mile buffer around the boundary. So next slide, please. The park is known for its thousands of Pueblo sites. These include not only ancestral homes, but also ceremonial sites, rock paintings, rock carvings, and cliff dwellings that continue to have meaning and value by tribal people today. 
We heard through consultation that the park continues to be utilized by Native American tribes as a continuous sacred landscape. Ongoing tribal practices occur throughout the park at locations known only to the practitioners. These tribal resources are complex and often include the entirety of the sky all the way to the, to the ground below. In addition, due to its dramatic elevation gradient, the park is home to several ecozones containing a rich diversity of plant and animal life. Next slide, please. One commercial air tour operator has the opportunity to conduct air tours under the interim operating authority. While the interim operating authority allows for up to 126 flights per year, the three-year average from 2017 to 2019 is 101 total flights conducted per year. There are currently no restrictions on routes, altitudes, or time of day for flights, and no procedures to establish no fly periods. Next slide, please. The draft air tour management plan proposes to reduce the number of overflights from 126 to zero. Consequently, there are no additional restrictions proposed beyond reducing the number of flights to zero. Next slide, please. This slide is intended to show the routes of the proposed draft ATMP. But because we're proposing to reduce the number of flights to zero, we didn't develop any proposed routes. Or next slide, please. So why are we proposing to eliminate air tours over Bandelier National Monument? Our analysis indicates that air tours are resulting in unacceptable impacts to the park's cultural landscapes and resources. In addition, through tribal consultation, we heard from multiple tribes that air tours violate the sacred spaces of the park, degrade the resources within, and violate the privacy of their traditional practices. Tribes indicated that the only acceptable solution to the impacts was to eliminate the air tours. Prohibiting air tours protects the park's sacred sites, ancestral sites, cultural landscapes, and traditional cultural properties. Prohibiting air tours improves privacy conditions for tribes during traditional uses and ceremonies within the ATMP boundary, respects the spiritual significance of the park to tribal people, and helps maintain cultural connections of those people to the park. Prohibiting air tours within the ATMP boundary is necessary to protect park resources and values, meet park management objectives, and is responsive to the concerns of the tribes. With that, I will turn it back over to Eric Elmore. Thank you, Superintendent Siddharth. I appreciate that. Um, I'm now going to talk a little bit about the National Environmental Policy Act, otherwise known as NEPA, um, and the interplay with uh, NEPATNA. So the agencies are complying with NEPA in the development of the draft air tour management plan. And as some of you may know that NEPA requires the agencies whenever there's a major federal action to consider the human and natural environment that could be affected by the action. And in this case, it's the air tour management plan. The agencies are required to determine the appropriate level of NEPA review in general, there are three levels. There's a categorical exclusion. Uh, environmental assessment is kind of a mid-level NEPA review. And the highest level of review is what's known as an environmental impact statement or an EIS. For this uh, ATMP, we are conducting an environmental assessment at this point. Um, finally, we are required to prepare those associated review documents, as well as, in this case, um, a final record of decision or ROD. The, uh, so as part of the process of this NEPA process, the agencies considered over 2,200 public scoping comments that were obtained from September 3rd through October 13th of 2021. 
uh, on the draft on the draft ATMP proposing the adoption of existing conditions. And as kind of was discussed earlier, based on the feedback during tribal consultation, as well as uh, based on the comments received on the initial draft ATMP back in September of 2021, as well as other um, consultations, excuse me, consultations, including with Fish and Wildlife Service um, and maybe other agencies, the uh, NPS and FAA agreed that we should prepare an environmental assessment in order to evaluate the potential impacts as well as reasonable alternatives for this air tour management plan. And we are now you know, reviewing the revised draft air tour management plan and the draft EA, and they are currently available for public review and comment. I believe that we will provide you uh, again um, how, how to uh, provide your comments through the Pepsi. Next slide, please. So, um, again, one of the things that we're also required to do, NEPA is triggered when there's a major federal action. Similarly, uh, Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act um, is triggered when there is a, a federal undertaking. Um, so in this instance, the uh, air tour management plan would be considered an undertaking that triggers the consultation requirements of Section 106. And the agencies are complying with that process uh, in the development of the draft air tour management plan, as well as uh, in developing the draft environmental assessment. So section 106 is, is mainly a process oriented statute and it has kind of four steps to that process. Initially, the agencies are required to define the undertaking as well as identify who the consulting parties are. After that, the agencies are required to determine what's known as the APE, or the Area of Potential Effects, as well as identifying any historic properties that are within that APE. The next step after that is to assess the potential effects to those historic properties from potential implementation of the ATMP. And then finally, we're required to resolve the adverse effects, if any, that might be uh, on, that might result on historic properties um, in order to uh, eliminate any of those potential adverse effects. So right now, as of today, the FAA and the Park Service have consulted with the New Mexico State Historic Preservation Officer, also known as a SHPO. Uh, we have consulted with Native American tribes and other consulting parties, including operators. The agencies have also considered comments during the scoping of the draft ATMP regarding the potential impacts to those cultural resources. At this point, the uh, FAA has proposed a finding of no adverse effect to historic properties in the letter that was sent to the SHPO, as well as to all consulting property, uh, excuse me, all consulting parties. So with that, I believe I'm going to hand it over to Michelle, who will provide an overview of the Section 7 Endangered Species Act consultation process. Okay, great. Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, so as Eric just mentioned, the FAA and the NPS are complying with Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act, or ESA, as they develop the draft ATMP. The purpose of this is to ensure that whatever is proposed as a proposed action does not jeopardize the existence of any listed species that are listed under ESA or result in destruction or adverse modification of any designated critical habitat. The agencies are currently in the process of doing the Section 7 analysis, and we anticipate that the preferred alternative of no air tours would have no effect um, on species that are listed under ESA or their habitat. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so as noted earlier, we are currently inviting comment from the public, from tribes, from other agencies, and all interested parties on the draft ATMP and the EA, and comments must be received by August 11th. 
If you joined um, after the presentation started, I'll just reiterate that the comments can be submitted one of two ways. It can either be done online through the NPS public comment website, and you'll see the link to that on the slide here, or you can mail your comments to the address also listed here on the screen. Uh, if you don't um, capture this address, you go to the Parks Pepsi website or the public comment website, you'll be able to get that address to um, agencies prefer to receive comments through the Pepsi system. But in the event that you have any issues with it, you can submit them the written comments to that address. Um, and just a reminder that the agencies are not accepting public comments via email. I also wanted to mention that there is a frequently asked questions or FAQ document that, that is also posted on that parks public comment website, along with the draft ATMP and the EA. And if one of our hosts could drop the link to the Pepsi page into the chat, it would be appreciated. Okay, next slide, please. Following the end of this public comment period, the FAA and the NPS are gonna review all of the comments that are submitted um, and they'll, they'll be considered as they develop the final ATMP and the NEPA analysis. They'll continue to coordinate and complete consultation under the National Historic Preservation Act and the Endangered Species Act and additional conversations with the tribes. And then we'll conclude the NEPA process by signing a decision document. Once all of this is wrapped up, the ATMP will be considered complete and it will be available for viewing on both the FAA and the NPS websites. Uh, FAA will then follow up with updating op specs or operation specifications um, for each air tour operator, which in this situation is unique because the allocations will be going away. Next slide, please. Okay, and so with that, we're about ready to move into the Q&A session of the meeting. Um, I'd like to first say thank you to all of the presenters, given us all of the information. For anybody that may have joined um, in the middle after we've started, my name is Michelle Carter. I'm an environmental protection specialist with the National Park Service, and I'm serving as the moderator this evening. Just a couple of housekeeping items. We wanna make sure that everyone is aware that this meeting is being recorded, so you'll be able to review it later. Links to this recording and to the PowerPoint slides that we shared this evening uh, will be posted on each agency's AT&P website um, and the public comment website once the team has had a chance to make them compliant with all of the online accessibility requirements. If you have a question you would like to submit, you can post it in the Google form using the link that is shared in the chat area of your YouTube window, or you have a phone, you can scan the QR code that you see here on the slide. The meeting tonight is focused on the draft ATMP and EA for Bandelier. Therefore, we ask that you keep your questions focused on this particular planning effort. But if you would like more information on any of the other ATMPs, you can visit the NPS or FAA websites and learn more about plans that we've already completed, um, or you can get links to plans that uh, may come up down the road that will be open for comment. And I think our, our meeting host may also have those, those links handy to drop in the chat. So if so, that would be appreciated. Also, just a quick reminder that any questions that are submitted through today's meeting will be considered as the agencies continue developing the draft ATMP, but they're not what we consider formal comments. The formal comments should be submitted one of the two ways I just mentioned, either through the planning environment and public comment website or uh, sent in via regular mail. And a reminder that the due date for comments to be received is August 11th at midnight mountain time. Also mentioned earlier is we've set aside 90 minutes for this meeting and we'll adjourn no later than 7 p.m. mountain time. In the event that questions are addressed before this end time, our plan is to hold the meeting open for a period of time to allow for additional questions to come in uh, after you've had a chance to reflect on maybe what you've heard during presentations or maybe even react to some of the questions or answers that have been submitted by other attendees. 
Um, so in the event that there's a delay with any of the questions, we may come on and off video a little bit and we'll, we'll see how things go. Um, the other thing that we might end up doing um, is to walk through a couple of the frequently asked questions that have been prepared that are posted on the sites um, just to review any additional information that we anticipate as possibly coming up. Um, we might also review a couple of the other questions that were received during other public meetings in the event that they seem applicable across the planning efforts. And with that, <clears throat> I will go ahead and move over to uh, the questions that we see coming in. I have a couple of screens here, so um, I'll be looking back and forth here at the screen. Uh, this first question, though, uh, we'll start off with Eric, uh, FAA. Eric, the question is, why didn't the FAA do a detailed economic analysis of the pros and cons for each alternative? Thanks, Michelle. Um, thank you for that question. Um, actually, I believe it's section 3.7 of the draft EA. Uh, it does include an analysis of socioeconomic impacts. Um, I know in general, uh, consistent with FAA order 1050.1F, the socioeconomic analysis that we conduct evalu evaluates how the elements of the human environment, such as population, employment, housing, um, or public services might be affected by the proposed action as well as the alternatives. And um, we think that this is consistent with, you know, not only 1050, but also the Council on Environmental Quality, CEQ regulations for implementing NEPA, um, which direct the economic agencies to do an economic analysis of federal actions that will affect the local or regional economies. And finally, I'd like to say that the uh, policies and rationale associated with the uh, socio economic impact analysis uh, was also consistent with NPS management policies. Um, so uh, we believe that the EA does contain an appropriate uh, socioeconomic impact for all the alternatives. So, but thank you for that question. And, and please, uh, again, we invite comments on the draft EA. So um, you, those uh, are always welcome to submit those into Pepsi. Thank you. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, and just for attendees, we're going to keep try to keep this slide up here so that uh, if people are popping on and off, um, everybody knows how to submit questions during this meeting, and then also uh, additional comments. Uh, all right. So um, this next question will go over to Ashley. Ashley, the question is asking. Well, it's stating one of the options available to the NPS for an ATMP is a VA a voluntary agreement. And they're asking, why was this not presented as alternative four? Yeah, so thanks for that question. Um, so the agencies are working under a court ordered plan right now, and that's, a, that's to bring 23 parks into compliance with the National Parks Air Tour Management Act and PATMA. And then Patma states that you may establish an air tour management plan or enter into a voluntary agreement with a commercial air tour operator. You can do either one. And for this park, the agencies agreed that the best and most efficient tool to use granted to us by Nepatma was an air tour management plan. We proceeded with that plan originally in 2021. And um, yeah, and, and a voluntary agreement also does not require NEPA analysis. Uh, hopefully that answers that question. Thanks, Ashley. Okay, um, next question is going back over to Eric. Eric, there. Uh, the question is, how is it any better to force an air tour operator to fly over sacred sites outside of the park as opposed to inside the park. All right, thank you. And uh, thank you for that question. It's a really good question. Um, so I think the agencies, uh, in, as we are doing this analysis, um, we understand and assume that 
some of the commercial air tour operations um, may move outside of the ATMP, you know, jurisdictional boundary, that part um, boundary plus the half mile, um, as well as uh, potentially above the 5,000 foot AGL um, jurisdiction, uh, if you will, of Napatma. And so while we can assume that some of that would occur, um, it would be speculative. We just don't have an idea of exactly where uh, the commercial air tour operator might move operations. Um, and so we try to um, take that into consideration as we develop um, this air tour management plan. You know, it's it's really difficult to predict what they might do. And so we did include analysis that looked at the potential impacts of uh, if we were to move those operational uh, air tour operations just outside of the park boundary and try to do the analysis based on kind of our worst case scenario. But the exactness of the routes and the altitudes for these displaced air tours um, is, is just something that we can't really, we don't have any data to support. Um, and also, you know, when they're outside of this jurisdictional boundaries of Napatma, pilots are flying what's known as visual flight rules, VFR. And so where they're flying, it depends on safety, demand, weather, fuel, a, a number of variables that come into play that we just don't have sufficient data to, to do any more specific analysis on. So um, what I can say is that the prohibition that is um, a result of what, what we're offering up of commercial air tours in this draft ATMP are designed primarily to protect the park's national, um, you know, eligible cultural resources, because that is what Nepatma limits our jurisdiction to, commercial air tour operations within a, a, a national park. And so that's why the agencies um, are taking you know, part of the rationale behind why the agencies are taking the action that we are taking, but it, it is a good question. And, and that's uh, what we're kind of forced to do based on the jurisdictional uh, limitations of Napatma. Um, finally, I guess the, the provisions, you know, as the superintendent spoke about earlier, um, you know, they, they are really put forth to, you know, address the cultural resource impacts. Um, which we hope will maintain the confidentiality of the sacred sites and respect the spiritual significance of the park to the tribal people. So um, long, long, long way to say that we're somewhat limited by the jurisdictions of Napatma to what we can and cannot do, but it's a good question. So thank you. Thanks, Eric. <clears throat> Sorry, We'll actually have you go ahead and stay on here for this next question. The, it starts out with a statement, uh, the canyons of the Rio Grande adjacent to White, White Rock are a normal flyway for general aviation aircraft. And then the question is, why is the NPS excluding it as a transportation route for air tour operators? Oh, okay, so again, thank you for the question. So if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, it's it's talking about flyways for general aviation. And again, Napatma only applies to um, commercial air tour operations. And those are defined as any flight that's conducted for compensation or higher in a powered aircraft where the purpose of the flight is sightseeing over a national park or again within that half mile outside of the park boundary, as well as being, you know, within that 5,000 foot AGL and below um, airspace. So um, the air tours are subject to the regulations under Napatma and they do not include those other types of aircraft, uh, as I said earlier. So that that is why. But thank you for the question. Hopefully I answered it. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, and I'm sorry if I sound like a broken record, but I just wanted to take another opportunity for anybody that may have joined after the presentations to note that we are in the Q&A session. Um, you'll see instructions here on the screen as to how you can submit questions that um, you'd like the agencies to try to answer during the public meeting this evening. Uh, so just another little plug for that. 
And uh, with that, we do have another one in the queue here, uh, which we'll send over to Ashley. Ashley, the question is, did the NPS actually complete any comprehensive archeological digs to determine the number of historic sites that are included in the APE? Thanks for that question, Michelle. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, what I can say about the, the cultural landscape is that, you know, it's, um, it's comprised of over 3,000 ancestral sites. So it has a lot of um, uh, ancestral sites in a very small area. Um, also dozens of actively used shrines and sacred sites. Uh, it includes really diverse ecosystems across an elevation gradient. And those sites are really important to, to tribes and they are distributed throughout the entirety of the park. Um, and throughout the whole Section 106 process, the agency has really requested consulting parties input to help identify historic properties within the AP. The agency's provided an initial historic property identification list to um, consulting parties in a letter in August of 2021. And they requested further input on the identification of historic properties within the proposed AP. And there was another letter in 2023 that was sent to uh, the New Mexico SHPO tribes and consulting parties with that updated historic property list. Consulting parties provided comments during meetings as well as written comments regarding the identification of historic properties, which the agencies took into consideration. And the historic properties list was provided the final in April 20th, 2023 in the finding of effects letter. No additional surveys were actually conducted for this planning effort. Uh, unevaluated or undetermined properties have been treated as eligible for the purposes of Section 106 consultation and NEPA evaluation, but the park um, has conducted surface pedestrian surveys of over 95% of park lands as a method of identifying um, historic properties in Vandalier. So thanks for that question, Michelle. Thanks, my mute button's a little sticky here. Um, all right, so actually, Ashley, we'll have you we'll have you stay on for this next question. It, it kind of piggybacks on what we just discussed, um, and it's asking if the NPS has any way to determine the spiritual impact of an occasional aircraft that's flying two thousand feet uh, above the ground over a historic site. Okay. Um, uh, since the parks, yeah, since the parks fundamental resources and values, those are uh, can be found in the foundation document. They include um, preserving the connection between the Pueblo people and sacred space that the park protects. And because as I stated earlier, there's a high density of tribal sites within the park, um, it really means that it's not quite possible to avoid impacts to many of these sacred sites from air tours. The agencies have selected the no air tours within that ATMP boundary in order to be consistent with that park purpose and value found in the foundation document and for which the park is established. Um, the elimination of air tours would provide uh, it also improved pri privacy for the tribes during traditional uses and ceremonies um, within the ATMP boundary. So we can say that. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ashley. Um, just another uh, reminder to folks that are attending the meeting this evening. Um, the, this planning effort is focused in particular on Bandelier National Monument, and if you have questions about any of the other ATMP planning efforts that have either been completed or that are coming down the road, feel free to um, go to both the NPS and the FAA websites, and you'll be able to find more information about other planning efforts, too. Um, okay, so looks like we have another question here. Um, 
we're going to go uh, over to Eric. Eric, uh, they're saying under NHPA, which is the National Historic Preservation Act, and NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, what is the difference between an undocumented complaint of aircraft noise and actionable evidence of an adverse impact? Hmm. Okay. Um... So I guess I'm I'm going to interpret that question because um, when you talk about an undocumented complaint versus um, adverse impact, uh, to me, that kind of goes to kind of our impact methodology um, and, and how we look for impacts uh, or how we assess impacts either under NEPA or the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, so hope, hopefully I'm, I'm taking this in, in the right context. Um, and if not, please, uh, whoever did ask the question can, can follow up. Um, but I guess how I'm interpreting that question is that, um, you know, the, the agencies, we, we look at the cultural resources and we use kind of under NEPA, in particular, the CEQ regs, as well as our implementing regs under 1050 and, and, and NPS's implementing regs. Um, they tell us to look at um, the context and intensity of the impacts on, on a particular resource. And so that, that those are the aspects that the agencies looked at when we um, considered the what are the impacts of commercial air tours on these resources either from a, a, a NEPA uh, perspective or under uh, a National Historic Preservation Act uh, perspective. And so um, it, it's pretty similar. And at the, at the end of the day, the, the effects to the cultural resources, they occur if the implementation of, of the alternative would either alter the characteristics of that cultural resources uh, and and those characteristics in particular that make that resource eligible for for listing on the national register um, or otherwise make that resource culturally significant. So I, I'm hoping that I'm I'm answering the question appropriately. And, and please, again, uh, we can, we encourage you to submit your your comments or questions in, into Pepsi. And um, hopefully, I answered your question. So thank you. Great, thanks, Eric. Okay, this next question will go back over to you, Ashley. Uh, the, the question is, in what year did the FAA conduct actual field studies to determine the impact of air tour noise in, uh, to determine the impact of air tour noise in specific, maybe in specific areas is what they're saying. So can you take that, Ashley? Yeah, so the last time we collected uh, that data in the park was in 2012, and we collect that acoustic data to characterize the natural and existing ambience so that's both with and without air tours. Um, sound level measurements were collected in four different locations in the park. Um, and this dis discloses what um, the existing ambient condition of the acoustic environment for the park is, and we can also calculate what the existing natural uh, ambient for the park is. Um, and then from that data, we can use noise modeling to really evaluate the potential noise, pack, noise impacts of different um, scenarios for an air tour management plan and different alternatives. Um, and that's what we did for this planning effort um, in 2023. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, thanks. And Ashley, we'll actually have you stay on. It's kind of, it's kind of a piggyback question here. Um, the next one is asking, how does the NPS differentiate between air tour noise and existing noise? Okay. Um, yeah, so one of the a park, one of the main park resources that we are, you know, are discussing in, in this question is the natural soundscape. And one of the ways that we quantify the natural soundscape is through a natural ambient sound pressure level. And that can describe the natural quiet of a of a park. 
Um, the natural ambient sound pressure level includes um, what would occur in the absence of human noise. So it includes all the naturally occurring sounds um, associated with, with bandolier, and it, it excludes all mechanical human-made sounds, electrical sounds, motorized sounds, including air tours. So the term existing ambient refers to that sound level um, that includes all of the noises in the park, human and natural. Um, and so we can really, uh, to get to the question, um, you know, we can really um, differentiate between in those two different levels um, between the natural quiet in a park and what um, the acoustic environment sounds like with, with air tours. Um, and data for both of those measurements are actually um, in, in the ATMP and the draft EA uh, in chapter 3.1.1. So thank you for that question. Great, thanks Ashley. Okay, looks like we have a, maybe a couple more questions here coming in the queue. Um, just as a, a reminder, a check as to like where we are in the meeting, we have about uh, 30 more minutes available to us for this Q&A session. So if folks are on um, and have joined late, like feel free to uh, submit your questions by scanning the QR code on your screen or by clicking on a link that the, the host have dropped into the chat. Um, just that quick reminder for folks. And with that, I think we are actually gonna go back to over here to Ashley. Um, another question related to noise we have here, Ashley, and they're asking, where are the current figures for ambient and existing noise in the park? And there's a parentheses with the 2023. Okay. Um, so the draft EA uses um, ambient data that was last collected in, in 2012, but these conditions don't, don't change substantially over time. So we model what the conditions are. Um, in, in, in when we're looking at the different scenarios. So we haven't actually collected field data in 2023. Um, and it's because these conditions really do not change substantially over time. So uh, we can use this data to inform our modeling conditions. So thank you. Yep, thanks Ashley. Okay. Two more questions here. Um, we'll go over to Eric. Eric, I'll start with this one. Uh, they're asking, what is the actual number of documented current complaints of air tour noise? And how many did the FAA receive? And how many did the NPS receive? Thanks, Michelle. Um, and thanks for the question. Um, I don't know if I have specific numbers of complaints received by either of the agencies, um, and we might be able to, to get that information on the specific on the specifics um, of individual complaints. But what I do know is that during the um, ATMP development process, the agencies received. Uh, significant feedback, negative feedback from the tribes uh, in regards to the impacts of commercial air tours. Um, I think there were uh, five tribes that were involved in the consultation process and they all provided uh, negative feedback in regards to the commercial air tour impacts on. Uh, and so those were the complaints from the tribes. I, again, I don't have specifics on the other individuals. We might be able to get that for you. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, thanks. And then the next one for you, Eric. They're asking if um, if the NBS has done any studies to document how much of a visual intrusion is actually possible from a two thousand foot AGL above ground level uh, uh, flight based on uh, the naked eye. 
Yeah, uh, so thank you for that question. Um, I, I don't know if there is a specific study. I, I don't know, and in, in Park Service, maybe you can speak to that. But but I do know that, it, you know, the environmental assessment, um, section 3.8, is where the agency's analysis of the visual impacts of the various alternatives um, is located. Um, and, and I would recommend that the uh, commenter and, and members of the public um, uh, take, a, take a look at that. And that should kind of explain the methodology and how we assess the visual impacts of the various alternatives. Um, and basically, the impact analysis focuses on what the uh, effects to the park view sheds and notable visual resources are. And that's as in as what's in, identified in the affected environment section of the EA. And this notes that any aesthetic value or unique aspects within the park, um, those are things that we're looking to see if they're impacted. The ana analysis, we look at how ATMP operating parameters, um, things such as the number of tours, uh, the location of the routes, the altitudes of those tours, and, and other things, uh, how they might affect the park view set for each alternative um, and the resultant park view set resource conditions and see how that would be changed um, by the proposed alternative. Um, and then we compare the existing conditions to, to that delta, if you will, or the change that would result from the various alternatives. And that's how we kind of do, that's the methodology of how we do our view shed analysis. So. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Eric. Um, and just a reminder about the um, about the analysis itself. The the EA is available on the the public comment website. So if you do have more specific questions about how the analysis was conducted um, or what was considered. All of that information is available on the website. And as part of this public comment period that we're in right now, we are, are looking for feedback on um, anything that the agencies may have missed in the analysis or um, you know, additional questions related to how those conclusions were made. So, so please make sure you do, um, after this meeting, if you have additional questions, please submit those comments, uh, preferably via Pepsi, but you can also submit them regular uh, via regular mail. Okay, looks like we do have now a couple, a couple more questions. Um, Ashley, this one uh, we'll send over to you. The question is, why is there not one common standard for all air tour operators flying over all national parks? So the Park Service so the provisions and conditions in this ATMP are designed primarily to protect this park's national and register listed or eligible cultural resources, including sacred sites, including bandoliers ancestral sites, including bandoliers cultural landscapes. Um, and and all, all of which of those things include the natural resources within bandolier. So they're specific to this park. Um, and they, the, the proposed ATMP, um, you know, protects the resources within Bandelier from the effects of commercial air tours and su supports the management objectives for this park. Um, the provisions and conditions also really maintain confidentiality of sacred sites and really respect the spiritual significance of the park to tribal people. Um, they help to maintain cultural connections to this park and respect privacy for the tribes um, local to, you know, near that, that find Vandalier significant. Um, and they protect the, the privacy during traditional uses and ceremonies, um, and they do that within the ATMP boundary. Um, and this ATMP really prioritizes and elevates the voice and values of those tribal nations. So the ATMP, in addition to that, also reduces the impacts to wilderness and visitor experience. But these are all things that are um, very important to um, Bandelier and are, you know, uh, we're we're not doing this. Um, these uh, these impacts were analyzed specifically for this park in this one. 
And thanks for that question, Michelle. Yep, and uh, Ashley, we'll go ahead and have you stay on here for the next one too. Okay. Um, looks like we're, we're receiving some questions about the various trade-offs that are needed to protect park resources with this plan. Uh, and to summarize, they're asking, how is the proposal for the current plan selected and what does it intend to achieve? Okay, since the parks, like, thank you for that question, Michelle. Um, since the parks fundamental resources and values really include preserving this connection between the Pueblo people and the sacred space the park protects, and because the density of tribal sites within the park means that it's not possible to avoid impacts to sacred sites from air tours, the agencies have selected that no air tour alternative within the ATMP boundary in order to be consistent with the park's purpose and values for which it was established. Um, and because the elimination of air tours would improve privacy conditions for the tribes during traditional uses and ceremonies within the ATMP boundary, um, we, we chose this, this alternative. So thank you for that question. Okay, thanks, Ashley. Um, just another check in with folks out there. Um, it's 638 Mountain Time. Uh, we do have a couple more questions here in the queue, but uh, it does look like maybe uh, some of them have slowed down. And we're prepared to stay on until 7 p.m. Mountain Time if folks think of additional questions. So please feel free to continue submitting them. Um, just wanted to share that as a quick reminder. But in the meantime, we'll go ahead and go to this next question in the queue. And Eric, this one's going over to you. Uh, they're asking, will aircraft noise now be shifted to surrounding park communities instead of being absorbed by the remote backcountry? Uh, yeah, so first, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, Yes, so I would say that, again, the agencies um, understand and, and kind of assume that um, if there are no commercial air tour operations authorized to um, fly within the park, um, that that will likely result um, or could result in those air tour operations being displaced just outside of the park boundary. Um, and so Again, I, I think while we do understand that that is something that is possible and, and could occur, we just don't have the data to say exactly, you know, with specificity um, and with confidence where, in fact, those displaced flights would occur. Um, and so um, we do know that it's possible that they, um, as a result of this air tour management plan, that the operator could either fly just outside of the park boundary or fly above the 5,000 feet AGL. Um, and again, um, we're not sure exactly where and how the operator um, might fly, but we do know that there are some constraints, if you will, um, that would limit, I guess, potential impacts outside of the park or just outside of the park. I think number one, um, right um is that the air tour operators would be flying visual flight uh rules so they they have to do what they can for safety um being able to avoid other aircraft in the area and so there are a number of things that are going to come into play so i think first of all on the um i think it's to the north of the park that um there's restricted airspace um and so in regards to potential for air tour operations to be displaced over there that's unlikely to happen um in regards to displacement above the 5000 foot agl jurisdiction um limitation that is possible but there are uh, um, certain requirements that require operators to provide supplemental oxygen if they're above 
10,000 feet MSL. And so at this park in particular, 5,000 feet AGL is going to be equivalent or, you know, exceed that um, 10,000 foot mean sea level um, uh, altitude. And so that's a limitation on the operator potentially flying above that. And so um, we do consider the potential for those impacts and, and we have analyzed those in the draft environmental assessment. Um, and so, Please, again, we, we, we encourage you to, to take a look at it and to provide any comments on that. Um, but we did conclude ultimately that the noise impacts of those displaced aircraft would not be significant. But thank you for the question. Okay, great. Thanks, Eric. Um, and if you want to grab a drink of water, we have another one here for you in the queue. The question is, what are the advantages of air tours for a national park and for the general public? And are there substantial benefits? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question, first of all. Um, so, you know, obviously commercial air tours, they offer a recreational experience um, for those who wish to view the park from a different vantage point. And so, I don't know if there's one thing that's better than the other, but obviously um, commercial air tours give you a, 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 the park visitors who utilize that. It does give them a different way to view the park. Um, and so I don't know if it's better than being on the ground or not, but clearly it's, it's a slightly different way. Um, and it does, I guess, potentially provides slightly some benefits to maybe some park users, um, but it, it's a hard question to, uh, to really answer. I think there are benefits and, and um, liabilities, if you will, to, to both ways of, of visiting the park. There are different impacts from various uh, ways that visitors uh, experience and visit the park. So hopefully I answered the question. Thank you. Great, thanks for that, Eric. And thank you, everybody that's attending right now with your patience with me, just trying to make sure I'm keeping up with the questions that are coming in and anything additional that we may want to answer here. Um, Okay, looks like we do have another question. Um, Eric, if you don't mind coming back on. The, the person is asking if they are correct that there are currently no authorized air tours at Bandelier at this time. Oh, thank, thank you for the question. Um, actually, there currently is one commercial air tour operator um, that has, again, what we call IOA or Interim Operating Authority at Bandelier. That operator has uh, authorization right now to fly up to 126 commercial air tours per year. Um, and Again, one of the things that NAPATMA requires is air tour operators to submit uh, reporting data semi-annually to the agencies. And the agencies, you know, in looking at that reporting data, um, the three-year average for operations at Bandelier, looking at reporting data from 2017 through 2019, that operator has conducted an average of 101 commercial air tours every year. So they're authorized right now for 126. Three-year average uh, is about 101, but there is uh, one commercial air tour operator who does have authorization to conduct air tours at Bandelier currently. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. So from what I can tell, on my end, it 
doesn't appear that um, new questions are coming in. Um, as we did mention earlier in the meeting, um, you know, we're committed to being here until about 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, if there are additional questions that uh, do come in, so we um, would like to give folks out there a couple of minutes to think, either think through some of the stuff you've heard, or the presentations, and um, if you do have additional questions, like feel free to submit them at this time. For those that may have joined a little bit later, um, the way that you could submit questions is using, uh, it's like scanning the QR code that you see on the screen here, or the uh, meeting hosts have, I think, dropped links to the question form into the chat. So feel free to keep them coming in here. I'll wrap up in the end with a reminder about submitting uh, official comments, but uh, as you also think through some of the stuff that you've heard tonight, you, either via the presentations or through the questions, if you feel like um, either something was missed in any of the analysis, if there's um, different elements of the alternatives that um, folks feel like should be considered, if there's additional uh, literature sources that you feel like the agencies should consider, like those are the types of things that we're also looking for feedback on. So please submit those comments using the uh, Pepsi system. I'm gonna scroll back over here really quick, just to see uh, if anything else has come in. Looks like it's still pretty quiet out there. I think maybe they're, there's a couple of folks out there. Um, so we'll give you a couple of minutes. In the meantime, I'm going to go off camera for just a moment and um, give you guys a chance to possibly submit some other questions if you have them. Well, thanks to those of you out there that are patient with the process and allowing other, others an opportunity to submit questions. Um, this, uh, we have a question here that will go over to Eric with the FAA, and this is um, not necessarily something that came in tonight, but um, it is something that has come up as part of other AT&P planning efforts, and so we thought it might be helpful to go ahead and, and review this. Um, this. Eric, this question is asking, what happens to an operator's interim operating authority, or IOA, after the ATMP is established? Yeah. Um, so yeah, this question has come up a couple of times and, and it's a good question. And I think it's um, worth kind of repeating kind of what happens. Um, so under NAPATMA, all interim operating authority um, for an individual part terminates by operation of law 180 days after the establishment or the effective date of the ATMP. So after that time, no operator can rely on op specs issued under interim operating authority. Um, new op specs, amended op specs will be issued um, to um, show what um, the operator is authorized or not authorized to conduct. Um, and we just want to make sure that it's understood that the once the once the ATMP is final by operation of law, operators no longer able to utilize IOA as authorization to conduct air tours. So thank you. Hey, thanks, Eric. Scrolling through here again, I think that I'm not seeing any new questions coming in. I'll give it a, another minute or two um, before we um, pass it over to the park um, for some brief closing remarks. And then um, I'll go ahead and close this out with any final housekeeping reminders. But it looks like Looks like we're actually probably good here. Um, we really do appreciate all of the active participation tonight. We had a lot of really good questions. And so uh, thank you for those of you out there that submitted questions. Um, and now with that, um, 
Superintendent Seth, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you for some closing remarks. If you are ready to come on really quick. Sure, thank you, Michelle. Really appreciate it. I appreciate all the, the work you put into to facilitating this meeting and, and many others that are have been similar. And I, I also wanna thank all of our, our people in our Washington and our, our, uh, our uh, Natural Skies and Sounds office in, in the region and in Washington for helping us navigate through this, this process. Um, also the Volpe Center, um, also my, my deepest thanks to you for also keeping this uh, process moving along. And, and obviously of course, to our, our partners at the FAA um, that, that, are, that are in this with us every step of the way. I, I also really wanna, wanna um, express my gratitude to the, the many tribal members and the many tribes that really uh, painstakingly and with a lot of candor um, educated us about, about um, what's important to them and what, what things that we needed to um, be aware of when we were considering this and, and many, many other um, issues that face the park every day. So um, thank you for your candor. Thank you for your, continue, your continued input into park operations and, and into these kind of things and, and in many, many others. And then finally, I really want to thank everybody who sat through this meeting today um, and listened to these uh, this presentation. I want to thank everybody who was uh, brave enough to make it all the way through this entire meeting. And uh, and uh, my sincerest thanks for everybody that uh, took the time to ask questions and and hopefully to comment on our uh, our environmental assessment as we move forward with that. Comments such as yours play a really vital role in the management of national parks and national park areas. And it is important to the National Park Service that the voices of the, of the public and the people that we serve are heard on, on serious decisions and serious matters such as this. So thank you very much for your participation in tonight's meeting. And with that, I will give it back to Michelle for um, housekeeping. Great, thanks. Um, and I'd like to read for anybody that has been on since the very beginning and uh, appreciate your patience with maybe some redundant messages. Uh, we're just trying to do our best to make sure that we're getting information out there and uh, letting folks know how they can participate in a meaningful way. Um, so with that, if folks joined in the middle of the meeting, a reminder that there's a frequently asked questions document that's on the Parks Pepsi or the public comment website, along with the draft ATMP and EA. Also, this meeting is um, was recorded, and once the agencies have had a chance to apply closed captions and make everything compliant with online accessibility requirements, uh, the links to the recording and associated documents will be posted on the agency's websites and also on the public comment website. Another reminder that any formal comments you might have um, should be either submitted through the public comment or the Pepsi website or sent to the mailing address that you'll see here on the screen. And the deadline for all comments is August 11th. And with that, I just would like to say on, uh, on the behalf of the FAA and the NPS, thank you for your participation. We look forward to hearing from you and have a great rest of your evening. Take care, bye.